Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Matter Startup Showcase. I am Stephen Collins, CEO of Matter. We are a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub built on a belief that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. At our uh, startup showcases, we pick a topic and invite three Matter member companies to present their solutions to a panel of industry experts. Today's program focuses on solutions that help underserved patients receive and manage the care they need. Perks Health, Yumlish, and Kliexa will share how their solutions do just that. Uh, we have three experts here to ask the startups questions following their pitches. Two of them come from innovative health systems and one is a healthcare venture capitalist. All three of them have terrific perspective on the fundamental issues these startups are addressing and a strong pulse on market dynamics. Uh, Janelle Conway is the Strategic Program Manager of Performance Improvement at OSF Healthcare. Janelle is responsible for piloting with startups, integrating social determinants of health assessments that enable OSF care teams to provide whole person care. Next, we have Marina De Pablo. Uh, she is a Patient Education Manager at UChicago Medicine. In this um, nurse leadership role, Dr. De Pablo coordinates system level innovations to address health disparities in the patient experience and engagement program at UChicago Medicine. And finally, we have Siraj Udichintala, who is an associate at Arboretum Ventures. And Siraj assesses investment opportunities and supports Arboretum's portfolio companies. Each company will have seven minutes to pitch, followed by seven minutes of Q&A with panelists. All right, time for our first company. I'd like to welcome Scott Taylor, who is the co-founder and CEO of Perks Health. Hi everyone, I'm Scott Taylor and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Perks Health. Um, sorry. At Perks, we, we build programs for people managing chronic conditions. Um, with a focus on engaging those patients first and foremost, and Perk successfully engages patients four to five times a day, uh, helps them achieve treatment plan adherence of over 95%, and have now actually clinically demonstrated our outcomes for patients uh, in a gold standard RCT. Um, and all of this can be achieved regardless of the patient's uh, complex social determinants of healthcare, level of health literacy, or the number of conditions indeed that they're managing. I think uh, everyone probably on this call has seen some version of the future of digital chronic care um, pitched to them in, in, in yeah, previously, uh, whether that consists of a digital patient app or a, a you know, online kind of web portal um, connecting with virtual care teams. Um, and yeah, the idea is that we can engage with patients more frequently, identify and, and, and intervene where needed um, and ultimately prevent an escalation in healthcare costs. The unfortunate reality is that digital chronic care often struggles to enroll, engage and, and retain patients sufficiently to, to deliver impact. Um, and we have a systemic engagement problem with, with digital health. Um, the other, I guess, dirty secret of digital health is that most, for the most part, those select few patients who are engaging, enrolling and being retained by digital health solutions are often those who are more health literate, more health engaged and, and with less social determinant health barriers. As a result, we're, we're already likely you know, that those patients who are engaging with digital health were probably more, li more likely to achieve better health outcomes uh, even without the intervention. And it's probably not surprising that that, that happens, uh, that we see those low engagement rates. When we think about the, the typical complex social determinants of healthcare patient or the underserved patient um, and what, what typical digital health looks like. Um, whilst the reality is that, you know, 50% of patients living with a chronic disease are actually managing two or more chronic conditions and, and you know, com complex social determinants of healthcare patients are overrepresented in, in, in polychronic patients. Um, the majority of typical digital health solutions are focused on a single condition area, um, whether that's diabetes or behavioral health or musculoskeletal. Um, the reality is the, the highest risk or the most complex patient is actually managing multiple conditions across those comorbidities. Um, the other reality is that complex social determinants of healthcare patients are, are, are statistically likely to have lower health literacy. 
um, and yet the majority of digital health solutions that, that we provide to those patients um, are information centric and consist of education, lessons, coaching, um, which is, isn't the best way to engage someone who has low health literacy. And the final thing is that digital health solutions by almost definition are technology centric, but rely on the latest advances, integrated smart devices, continuous internet connectivity, high bandwidth for downloading educational videos. Um, yet we know that patients with complex social determinants of health are less likely to have access to technology. They probably don't have the latest Apple Watch and they may not necessarily be willing to spend on large data plans. And this mismatch between the digital health solutions that we're designing and the complex patients that we need to have the most impact on is creating three major challenges for digital health. Uh, the first is that lack of patient engagement, that, that low enrollment rate, that low engagement rate, that low retention rate, um, that means that we, we struggle to actually provide digital health solutions to the patients who need the most help. Uh, the second is that we're overloading polychronic individuals with, with too many programs. Um, someone managing five different conditions, and that is 12% of US adults managing five or more different conditions. They're not gonna use five different apps to manage their, their, their healthcare. Um, they're ultimately gonna disengage and be overloaded and, and ultimately are not gonna interact with, with digital health. Um, and the final thing is that we're seeing a frustration from payers and providers. We're seeing a, a lack of real world outcomes for those complex um, patients, um, or even you know, kind of stopping at the, at the start line and not bothering to deliver digital health interventions to patients who have complex social determinants of healthcare needs. Perks looks to solve these pain points and deliver on the promise of digital care for all patients, uh, not just those who are highly health engaged or highly health literate um, or you know, who have access to employer sponsored health insurance. Um, and we can deliver high engagement and retention of all patients. Um, and the average patient engages with Perks four to five times a day. Um, we can use Perks to deliver our solution for any condition and any task that they need to complete. And um, in doing so, we can get people to engage and adhere to their treatment plan and deliver real outcomes for high-risk members. And indeed, PERC sets a new standard for high-risk member engagement um, and, and in digital care that we can deliver enrollment rates of 45 to 50%. We can deliver a daily engagement of 75% and we can retain those, those patients for, you know, uh, you know, for an extended period of time, averaging in you know, four to five sessions per day. We do that by, by using precision behavior change and it's kind of using a multiple you know, motivators across challenges, rewards, gamification and community to provide positive reinforcement in the near term, not rely on education as a mechanism for engagement and ultimately deliver a personalized experience for every patient using perks. And that engagement can then be translated into adherence to deliver perfect days, perfect months, perfect years. And I think that comes to the question of if you could engage your complex or polychronic patients four, four times a day, what would you do? And now over a dozen leading plans and providers are using perks in, in various ways to drive adherence across different condition areas from diabetes to behavioral health, to musculoskeletal conditions, and even conditions like HIV, dementia, cystic fibrosis. Um, and they can use that engagement that we drive on a daily basis to, to drive adherence to treatment plans. And those treatment plans can consist of medication, physical therapy, you know, activity, even health risk assessment can be collected through PERCs. And we see that level of engagement drive to a really high level of adherence. That's now been validated by clinical research in a gold standard RCT with the University of Sydney, which has now been published in both the British Medical Journal and the American Journal for Managed Care earlier this year found PERCS patients were twice as likely to adhere to their treatment plan and achieve a high level of adherence, um, but also saw a statistically significant impact on biomarkers. And this clinical trial was run in a real world population um, with a patient in a public health cohort who were you know, average age of 60 with multiple chronic conditions and generally lower socioeconomic status with complex social determinants of healthcare. We've also demonstrated the ability for that high adherence and that high engagement to translate to not just biomarker improvement in, in underlying health outcomes, um, but also cost savings for our commercial partners. We partner with health plans and, and, and uh, healthcare systems to deliver PERCS programs to their high risk, complex social determinants of health patients. Um, and in doing so, deliver over $6,000 in estimated cost savings per member working with one of our global health plans. We've also specifically clinically and commercially validated our impact with underserved populations um, from government insured programs with the largest healthcare system in Australia, so far as health, uh, across a range of different condition areas to high risk case management um, with a global insurer in QBE, where we demonstrated that $6,000 savings per member um, to working with a leading nonprofit health plan 
uh, where we en successfully enrolled low health literacy members and delivered a six times return on investment in just 12 months. We now work with over, a 12, uh, over a dozen leading health plans and healthcare systems who are now using perks to improve outcomes for their complex patients. The final thing that I'll mention is that piloting with perks is, is quick, easy, and low risk. And 100% of our pilots we, with healthcare systems and health plans are converted to full scale rollouts. Uh, it's very easy. We, we enable you to select the target patients that you, you want to intervene with, um, use our enrollment experts to maximize uptake. There's zero enrollment costs, zero implementation costs. Ultimately, we want healthcare systems and healthcare organizations to be able to trial perks with their complex patients and see the outcomes for themselves. And ultimately, they'll only ever pay if those patients are engaged. And most of with most of our customers will only ever pay if they're not only engaged, but achieving adherence and retention KPIs that, that, that our, our customers set. Thanks so much for having me today. And if anyone's in touch, uh, wants to get in touch and learn a bit more about Perks, um, feel free to reach out at scott.perkshealth.com. But happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Scott. I would ask, uh, Jarell, sorry, Janelle and Siraj and Marina to uh, pop on and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm, I'm happy to kick off. First of all, thanks for the presentation, Scott. That was really well put together and um, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned a couple times um, that there are a number of kind of point indication, you know, point solutions that are focusing on specific indications and, you know, a number of big names like Livongo and, you know, Somatis and other companies come to mind, I guess, you expand on just how competitive the market is um, for solutions like that. And is there a risk that your solution as you, as you continue to try to target the employers kind of gets lost in a bag of different solutions that that exist today yeah i mean i'd actually say one of the pleasing things uh, yeah, as as you can probably tell from my accent as well as uh the fact that you know a, a large you know, quite a few of our customers are based in australia one of the actually refreshing things about coming to the u.s market is whilst it is you know there's definitely more players in the market a lot of health plans healthcare systems and employers have trialed a digital health solution and being let down by, by the level of engagement or by the, the single kind of siloed touch point when they realize that actually there's people managing a number of different conditions and actually the average diabetes patient isn't just managing diabetes, they're managing three or four or five different comorbidities. Um, and so what I'd actually say is that you know, the, the more mature nature of the digital health market in the US means that when we have discussions with a health plan or with an employer or a healthcare system, um, the pain points that, that I'm describing here are much more well understood. And so they've, they've delivered a digital health program that, that is a coaching program for diabetes that they've seen only five to 10% of people enroll in or patients enroll, but then drop off after a really short period of time or not just, or fundamentally just not see those, you know, things that the, those cost savings that have been demonstrated in a clinical trial um, translate to their real world complex population. Um, and so I'd actually say, I mean, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a more crowded market, but actually where we think about our um, points of difference versus some of those you know, coaching solutions or you know, education solutions um, in engaging and ultimately sustaining behavior change for the long term. Um, there's a real understanding that you know, some of those solutions don't work for certain populations as well as they'd like um, and don't necessarily deliver the, the impact that they they'd like. And so it's really for us about you know, continuing to demonstrate that impact for those complex high-risk polychronic patients um, and demonstrate why PERCS is a suitable solution when someone's managing multiple conditions and may not necessarily be responding to an education-based or coaching-based intervention. Thank you. Scott, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about how you deliver your solution to patients that, are, that have low health literacy or have some access um, barriers. You mentioned that a lot of patients don't have um, a lot of data available. They, um, you know, they may not have the most up-to-date devices, et cetera. And that's certainly something that we see um, quite often with our patient population. So how do you deliver your product um, given those kinds of um, restraints or constraints that may exist for patients? Yeah, for sure. So I'll address them one by one. First on health, health literacy and then, then technology access. Um, so on the health literacy side, I think that one of the mistakes that a lot of digital health solutions make is presuming that education or information is an engagement strategy. That just by offering someone more information about their condition or more content or more lessons or more coaching, that that is gonna keep people engaged, retained and, and stick around for a long period of time to see that you know, long-term behavior change that we're aiming for. 
um, unfortunately for a majority of patients, not all patients, but for a majority of patients, education alone is not a compelling engagement motivator. So it's not a reason for them to stick around. It, for, for them, it's for most of them, it's another task in the treatment plan. It sits alongside medication, physical therapy, booking the next appointment, learning a bit more about their condition is like another task for them to do. Um, so what we need to think of in, you know, in delivering a digital health intervention is providing the motivation and the and the tasks and you know the, the to-do list and the motivation to get the to-do to -do list done. The way Perks approaches that is like let's solve the motivation program the challenge first, and then you know at, you know we, we don't have anything against education, but we just don't think it can be relied on to engage a low health literate or even you know someone who has high health literacy but just is not that engaged in their health. Um, we can motivate them and to engage first and foremost, and then use that engagement to educate them about their condition. And so that's why we use those motivators of gamification, rewards, challenges um, to engage patients four to five times a day, and then use that engagement to educate them, as opposed to relying on here's some education, come in and you know, learn more about your condition as a reason for people to engage. Because I think the, the empirical data is that when we offer that to patients, an overwhelming majority of them say, no, thanks, I'm not signing up in the first place. And then a, you know, another overwhelming majority of those who enroll say, okay, I enrolled, but I'm actually not finding this that interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm dropping off and I'm exiting the program. And so that's how we think about you know, how do we engage someone who has low health literacy or isn't just, or just isn't engaged by education or coaching standalone. Um, we, we bring the motivation first and then we provide the education and the tasks and the adherence you know, using that engagement. Um, in terms of technology access, um, as will surprise probably no one on this call, um, Australia is a pretty vast country. So even for us to run our RCT, um, we, we actually required you know, people who were, you know, in regional areas and remote areas of Australia where there was really limited you know, internet connectivity um, and who are using older devices by, by virtue of recruiting our RCT from the public health care system in Australia from free outpatient clinics that were being provided to people who didn't have insurance. It meant that they had older devices and for, for, for many of them didn't necessarily have great data connectivity. So even if they were paying for high data plans, um, didn't necessarily mean that they had a continuous internet connectivity. So one of the things that we have put a lot of investment in early on is actually making sure that patients can use perks for days on end without necessarily needing to connect to, to the internet um, and can actually have their treatment plan set up and consistently stick to their treatment plan and record you know, and be motivated to stick to the treatment plan um, without necessarily having to have access to data. And, and that is one of the, the, different, the, the different differences between us and, and a lot of other high tech solutions that are requiring device connectivity and, and you know, requiring constant internet access. Um, and so that enables us to deliver programs for people in rural locations who may not necessarily have continuous internet access or people who you know, simply don't have great technology access due to complex social determinants. Thank you. No All right, is there, uh, I think we have time for one last question, if anyone has one. I'll piggyback on uh, what Marina stated. For those, I, I think great opportunity, great presentation, and thinking specifically about the fact that you're addressing multiple conditions. For those, the populations that you mentioned maybe are not motivated and who are um, falling off of enrollment, what are you doing moving forward, um, knowing these populations are so at risk? How are you looking to engage them in the future? And what does that roadmap look like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, one of the things that I'd say about perks is part of the secret sauce is that we don't assume that there's one silver bullet for motivating patients. And we're constantly learning. So we'd release a new version of perks every two weeks. Um, and, and part of that you know, regular update in terms of how our technology works is taking the insights both, both the, the, the revealed insights, but the, also the user feedback on you know, what could make this more engaging, more motivating, could drive that engagement and retention higher and higher with those high risk patients or those, you know, those complex patients. Um, and so even in the kind of you know, three years that we've been running you know, large scale commercial programs, we've seen our daily engagement tick up from 65% to 70% to 75% as we continuously learned you know, what is working and what isn't working with those, those complex patients. And similarly with our enrollment rates, I mean, with every new program we launch, we see higher enrollment rates in the program. The, the most recent program we launched with a, a healthcare system um, in Texas, um, we saw 45 ticking up to 50% enrollment rates in that program. Um, and so I'd say you know, one of the things that we do take you know, at Perks is that 
you know, will never be finished on our journey to you know, figuring out the best way to engage um, those high risk and, you know, and complex patients. Um, we're constantly learning, iterating on the product and trying different motivators. Um, and you know, even the motivators that we use today are very different to the motivators we used when we launched the very first version of Perks a few years ago. Um, and it's because we're constantly learning and iterating based on user feedback, but also the insights and data that we're collecting along the way. Great, thank you. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Scott, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for sharing your uh, insights and, uh, and your company. Um, next up is Shireen Abdullah, who is the CEO of Yumlish. Hi, everyone. My name is Shireen Abdullah, founder and CEO of Yumlish. At Yumlish, we're on a mission to eradicate diet-related chronic illnesses focused largely on minorities by addressing social and cultural determinants. So. Um, let's start off by learning a little bit about Carla. Carla is of Mexican origin. She is a mother. She gets a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, and the best advice her physician can provide to her is to, quote, eat healthy. I think what we have to ask ourselves is what tools are we providing someone like Carla to, in fact, enable her to eat healthy? From our vantage point, there's a huge market gap in the way Carla receives care today. What she wants to know are things like, does insulin cause blindness? A huge misconception in the Hispanic community today. Time and again, physicians are telling their patients to stop eating tortillas and white rice. Um, can I reverse diabetes with herbal teas? Um, and what she's really getting is a one size fits all approach uh, that is largely focused on connected devices, uh, but not addressing nutrition in a meaningful way for Carla and for her peers. And that's really where we come in. At Yumlish, what we've done is we provide culturally adapted nutrition programs approved by the CDC and the American Diabetes Association. Uh, we provide these programs virtually. Um, it, we provide registered dietitian support, peer support through our programs. Um, we've kept a device less uh, for uh, remote monitoring. Um, and the biggest takeaway on this slide being that our program is low friction, which is essentially, it means that it is text and web-based for our user, really lowering barriers there uh, for adoption. So what we've created is a culturally adaptive program with low barriers offered in a low cost way. We've um, run multiple pilots. Uh, in fact, the most recent one that we ran in our diabetes population, we have seen success uh, here and is equal to 15. Uh, we've seen weight loss for our participants. We see stabilizing in blood sugar levels. Uh, we see uh, for those with uncontrolled diabetes, uh, uncontrolled diabetes with A1Cs greater than nine, we've seen a reduction of 2.26 points. Um, our participants also report more energy, better quality of sleep, uh, but more importantly here, what we're creating is 12.5 touch points per person per week. And again, this is all web and text-based. Um, and a weekly attendance rate in our program is 98%. And Carla is certainly not alone. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done in the Hispanic community that is disproportionately impacted by diabetes, by pre-diabetes hypertension, uh, and also cardiovascular disease. And then looking beyond the Hispanic population, really creating, again, a framework for providing that kind of care to next the African-American population. But again, a lot of work to do by looking specifically at these groups, their needs, and adapting the program to that. Starting the Hispanic market, however, um, there's a TAM there about 6.4 million after everything's said and done. Um, and just looking at reimbursable, uh, reimbursable encounters, which is health insurance reimbursement uh, of a $500 LTV, that's a billion dollar opportunity. Our traction to date has been phenomenal. Um, not only is our curriculum approved by the CDC and American Diabetes Association, but we have funding um, in non-diluted uh, capital from the CDC, from American Diabetes Association, from the NIH, uh, totaling uh, just around $850,000 for us. So um, some great news that we received last uh, month actually to that end. Um, so we have that. We're going into a risk-based model with the American Diabetes Association actually this month. So excited about that uh, potential for us as well. Um, really in our traction and where we're headed next is really focusing on federally qualified health centers, working with ACO's value-based organizations. We have two health systems uh, that we're currently working with. 
Um, and where we headed next, really being able to take that dietitian to patient ratio and creating a tech enabled service with that registered dietitian to really move the needle beyond that reach of one to 100 uh, patients for each dietitian, really moving that over closer to 500 patients for each dietitian by incorporating uh, different elements within AI and machine learning. Our team uh, is phenomenal. We have data scientists from Northwestern University. We've got uh, lead dietitian, we've got several dietitians who are bilingual, uh, but also understand the unique needs of this population that we're working with. Uh, we've got digital health experience on our team. Our, uh, I myself uh, have an MBA, a PMP, been a management consultant for a number of years prior to this. Um, these are advisors coming uh, from the Dell School of Medicine, uh, the UNT Health Science Center, and also from Texas State University. At Yemlish, we're truly on a mission to eradicate diet-related chronic illnesses and really empower people in their care so that Carla gets the care that she truly deserves. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shireen, and uh, loved your presentation. And now I'll turn it over to our panelists. I'll go ahead and kick off. Great presentation, uh, very interesting product. So a question for you, thinking about diet and some of the questions that you're hearing from your um, participants, understanding that some of them may have challenges in even securing the healthy food needed to support the proper diet. How are you partnering or how are you working to close that gap that may exist for them? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so one of the other things that we do um, is we uh, go through uh, specifically addressing food insecurity for them. Um, so that's part of the, the registration uh, that we do upfront and really understand and go through the USDA standardized uh, questionnaire around that. And if they are identified as being food insecure, kind of a mood point to talk about nutrition and not address that, right? So totally hear you on that. And so to that end, what we do is we work closely with them and we work through referrals in their community in their area and try to figure out the right pantry grocery solutions in the area that can help close those gaps for them. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure thing. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead with a, with a question. Thank you for that, um, that presentation. It was very interesting uh, um, and I really appreciated hearing about it as well. Um, I'd like to just kind of piggyback on Janelle's question, um, wondering if you partner with any other um, programs or um, apps that are out there, such as NowPal for those referrals. Yeah, so and Bertha, um, we, we utilize them. Shereen, thanks for, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so you'd mentioned that there are dietitians on the kind of that are kind of, I guess, engaging through the through the platform. I guess, how many? Can you talk about the scalability of, of your platform? I mean, how many dietitian? You know, what's your ratio of dietitians to patients? And you know, I, I guess, do you envision that as a problem, or um, as, as you look to grow, or is that something you've addressed? Yeah, no, uh, sir, that's a great question. So for us right now, the dietitian to patient ratio uh, is pretty much the industry standard, which is one to 100. So uh, uh, 100 patients for each dietitian. Um, and that's where I talked a little bit about the AI, I didn't go into it much, but that's the funding that we're getting from the NIH, in fact, um, is to test a proof of concept around increasing that patient panel size uh, for what we're aiming for is about one to 500. So really 5Xing that number, um, because you're very much right on there because um, as it stands with the dietitian today and the way nutrition therapy is really offered today, there are a lot of manual steps. There are a lot of silos. If you go to a dietitian today, you get seven recommendations. You do maybe two out of those seven, you go back to the dietitian a month later who has zero visibility into what's going on with you. Um, you go back a month later and say, well, nothing works for me. That dietitian has very limited insight into your behavior, your challenges, all those, those different things. What we're trying to bring it to is really be able to say, how can we bring those data points together? How can we understand, uh, you know, Surge's eating habits, his budget, his background? Um, how can we bring all of those things together to really drive this model at scale to, again, create that tech-enabled service that can then uh, have a dietitian really 5x their patient population? Great. 
Shereen, I have a question about integration with um, the primary provider or systems, um, EMR, and um, you know communications between your platform and the primary provider. How, how does that look? How does that work? Yep. So right now, the way it works is we keep a patient tracker with a certain dashboards on the back end. And of course, on the front end, we have a very seamless text and web base for the user. On the back end, uh, the provider can log on and really see how their patients are doing at any given point in time, what their attendance looks like, weight loss looks like. Um, the lab works at A1Cs is something we're able to pull from their, from their system. But on our side, they'll, it, they're able to see via these dashboards exactly what, uh, how the patient's outcomes are, are changing and how, uh, um, uh, how well they're is essentially uh, engaging with the program itself from a standpoint of attendance and then also just communication with us as well. Trina, just one more question for me. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned very briefly that you were you entered a risk-based contract with one of your clients. I guess, could you talk a little bit more about your business model? Um, yeah. That'd be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, we've got essentially two different models. So one is um, health insurance reimbursement. So we're a provider um, under certain plans here in the Texas area. Uh, which is why you saw that Texas map. I didn't mention this earlier on in Texas. Um, and so that's, uh, so we were able to bill insurance as a provider under those CPT codes. So that's model right. one. Uh, model two, that risk-based model that I, uh, uh, that I mentioned, Suraj, um, that is really specifically a risk-based model that is driven through weight loss itself um, and meeting certain metrics in terms of attendance, weight loss, um, and then dri that drives the revenue there for us. So it's an alternate model. We, um, like I mentioned, we went into it with American Diabetes Association. So we're really excited to see sort of what that looks like and an upside potential for us as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I just wondered um, if you would go into a little bit more about your peer support model. I assume that's something that's occurring outside of the dietitian. What does that look like? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that, Janelle. So um, the peer support model, we run that on Let's App, uh, which is an application used largely in the Hispanic population as well. It has a lot of reach there. They trust it. They understand how to use it. Um, and so in doing that, we run the peer support group there. I, I, um, it, it's almost like AA for diet, if you will. They share pictures of what they're eating, uh, going for a walk, what their fridge looks like. Um, they share recipes with each other. It's just, it's phenomenal the type of things that we see the support the encouragement the motivation um, that comes through there um, so uh, yeah so that's that's sort of where that peer support lies and and that's why we've kept it very text and web-based just meeting them exactly where they are great your percent attendance is amazing and Shireen thank you so much really appreciate it thank you everyone. nice presentation all right, I would now like to introduce Mehmet Kazgan, who is the founder and CEO of Cleexa. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for giving me the chance, everyone. Uh, I'm Mehmet Kazgan. I am with uh, Cleexa. I started the company in 2016. Very quickly, my background is software development, uh, almost 20 plus years. I work with companies like Google, Microsoft, Visa, PayPal, and landed in Aetna in 2013 which started my healthcare journey. And I left Aetna in 2016 as a vice president, built the My Aetna platform um, with the team over there. And I left Aetna to start my own um, adventure with Cleexa. And I wanted to really go after clinical data uh, with the patients. And basically, um, I'm, I'm actually tracking the same um, problems that you just heard from two great presentations today. Uh, with the multi-comorbidities, I'm actually looking the, at the picture a little bit different from um, the interaction with the patients and the clinicians and really managing like multiple devices, symptoms, and uh, the, the noise that the providers get today by, by a lot of technologies out there. So my idea was how can I create an intelligent onboarding and monitoring platform really communicating the health information exchange data and then also add different data buckets to it, like medication adherence APIs, device data APIs, and so on and so forth, really use the recipe for eight different subspecialties that we built and embed that information to the EMR directly to deliver basically clinicians a personalized care model 
with the taste of their treatment models, like dynamically updated along the treatment model. So we built this um, EMR and device agnostic platform specifically um, to the taste of providers. So you can have three different providers doing um, three different treatments for the same patient. And we really configure the, the data collection, data aggregation into that model and push that into the EMR. So mobile site, everything really appears in the EMR with eight EMR integrations with homegrown interactive services we built in the past. So idea is really connecting the patients with onboarding and follow-ups and then gather that information bi-directionally from EMRs and use clinical algorithms tailored to subspecialties along with their policies and ancillary services and aggregate this information with risk models, including STOH data, prioritization, risk models, and create a holistic view of patients with personalized care. So I think the most important part that we started this by I directly, uh, myself going to American College of Cardiology and said, I wanna build the patient tracking risk algorithms with you. You teach that to us and we'll build it ourselves in 2018, we partnered. And uh, for three years later, we actually deployed our solution. American College of Cardiology became an equity investor in the company. So we became the, the first and only innovation investment along with the co development partner. And then now this product is being actually deployed in two health systems and then two um, mid-sized clinics. Uh, we officially launched in two months ago and it's not live in production. So basically here's a, a picture of what the clinician would see fully customized in any EMR, regardless of what the EMR is using. We, we work with the Epics of the world all the way to Greenways of the world as well. And HL7 Smart APIs, Fires is our integration services talking to the system, gather the information to a clinician. Uh, this is an example for a type one diabetes patients with um, basically a heart failure that you can, we can actually get even diet data, or we can even communicate with the other platforms today represented. And then we just define this uh, in an EMR patient report, both discreetly and in a PDF. I think market is obvious uh, with the chronic care management space. Um, I don't want to get into that because I think you have seen the, the statistics uh, from the other two investors, I mean, um, entrepreneurs today very well, but we're really focusing on the non-acute care providers and it ranges from small to mid-sized clinics and health systems. Um, according to our business model, we're offering the solution as a wraparound through the EMR. You can use it as an intelligent onboarding uh, which the same model can be used as like remote patient monitoring. So uh, along with these customers, we have almost like clinics who are managing 100% uh, Medicaid patients that we onboarded in the past, which I will quickly talk. One of them is actually a clinic that I personally own with 74 employees. Uh, it's an integrated pain facility with 95% of Medicaid population. I will share some metrics with you, but we are offering uh, basically provider per month SAS fee with a 3x ROI from additional reimbursements on the fly. And we have hard metrics that we proved it. Um, three case studies we published. Uh, the one in the middle has been peer reviewed by Kaiser Permanente. All three different ones are actually talking about managing patients at the clinic using digital platforms. One of them is focused on 55 plus over people using digital platforms. And one of them is actually uh, Medicaid heavy patients actually on um, a, a $1 million grant. We partner with Banner Health and uh, UNC. Um, and that's actually live with Banner Health is one of our customers right now. So the real outcomes I wanna share with you, I think that applies to a really underserved population in a clinic here. Uh, if you look at the, the middle one, it, the clinical outcomes is huge. Uh, we really decrease the opioid prescriptions uh, by use, utilizing our risk certification framework by basically offering ancillary services that CLIEXA directly certifies the risk patients and obviously financial outcomes by gathering documentation in the EMR on the fly actually just increase the revenues 15% at a minimum. So we grew about 12X uh, by the end of 2022, we signed three major health system contracts again in Q4 2021, which should start getting revenues starting in uh, Q1 22 as we are already live. And we have partnerships with EMR companies and growing the data as we grow. So uh, the differences between um, what we are offering compared to CCM platforms, integrated platforms, intake platforms, or RPMs, 
we're actually an entity on platform that we can cons cons you know, basically uh, configure the platform to any device, any EMR. Um, so there are Livongo of the world, which are specific to hardware and diabetes. We can even partner with those companies to really monitor more than two comorbidities at a time. Our customer acquisition go to market plan is really expand our existing um, uh, large health system contracts and really go through the EMR integrations with the marketplace partnerships. With that said, thanks for giving me this opportunity and happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Mehmet. Uh, great presentation. I will uh, turn it over now to the panelists. I can go ahead and kick off. Um, Mehmet, thank you for that great presentation. Really, really interesting platform. Um, I'm going to start off by asking you about the health literacy um, and how you address that with the patient facing component of your platform. Absolutely. So, uh, Marina, I'm going to try to give you uh, two different perspectives. If I don't hit your answer, please interrupt me at any time. So I have that tendency usually. So um, the, the way that uh, if, we, if we pick up like this um, integrated pain clinic example, 97% um, of the patients, I will say on this specific one, we have multiple clinics that we are live already, are, are Medicaid patients, right? And managing those patients really is about like getting them onboarded and then giving them information that they need up front. So for example, majority of these patients are, this is their last resort. They are basically are referred from primary care clinics because they don't really want to, or it's risky to manage without pain um, kind of subspecialty experience. So this is their last resort and they want to get more medication or refills or manage their medication right away. Well, if you tell the patient before like the visit, hey, doctor is going to not likely change your medication as an MA or a front desk person, that patient is likely going to be really upset about the, the outcomes. But if you basically drive a policy through the patient's understanding, and this, is, this should be like a transcribed information to tell the patient, look, we're going to help you. And with that, you need to give us some information. Most of it we collect automatically. Don't worry about it. But we want to know that through this treatment program, the outcomes really are related to the risk of opioids. So let us work with you, giving you options of mental health, uh, coping skills training. Let's do steroid injections instead of like doing opioid management. Well, it's it's really hard to give that information to a, I don't know, 17 year old patient versus an 85 year old uh, veteran, like really uh, fighting with. And I have seen that in my own clinic too. So what you do is really collect the information and give them on basically a tablet, like simple tablet. We have a case study, we have done it. Um, and we did it like 55 plus above. We said, okay, we don't teach you anything. Here's the tablet, just go through it. Well, they basically answer simple questions. And imagine when they answer those questions, we basically apply in the background clinical assessments, hundreds of them, depending on the clinic's policies or payer models. And then we basically spit the information out in EMR real time. But for the patient side, we're saying, uh, these are the eligible options for you. Uh, please tell your doctor that before the medication management, this is what's gonna happen. And MA sits with that, explains that to the patient at the same time. So before they really start seeing the doctor, they already know what the policy driven guidelines and treatment models they're gonna see. So they're not gonna push their doctor to say, hey, you're not gonna change my, my medication today. So that's kind of like one way to do it. But in between visits, the engagement, which we all try to solve this problem is really driven with their guidelines too, right? If you wanna keep the patient on low risk, then they know that their medication management can be handled. So we are telling the patient, the more you respond to your personalized care notifications on this mobile platform in between visits, so we are also monitoring your urine analysis, it's going to be easier for you to see that we can manage your medication. So that's kind of like the engagement part we did in between by training the patient that you're under uh, the policy, this, this clinic can provide certain services with your help. I don't know if I covered your um, uh, question, Marina. Thank you. You bet. Hey, Batman, I, I have a question. Can you can you actually flip back a couple slides to the one with the various revenue streams that I think you had the RPM on there? It was a chart with some of, yeah, the slide 12. Slide, this one? The one after this one, I think. Oh, this is the... Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess, 
you know, you, the data monetization and the, the revenue streams that you're opening up for the providers on the provider side, I guess, have you, fa- as you, as your product gets adopted into various provider groups, are you facing challenges with kind of workflow and integrating with physician workflow and particularly um, curious on some of the remote patient monitoring that you're, excuse me, sorry, I got a team call. Uh, specifically regarding um, some of the workflow around patient monitoring and remote patient monitoring, et cetera. My understanding of the payment on those codes is that it's quite cumbersome uh, from a workflow perspective. So could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Great question. So um, actually, that's where the whole um, like clinical data processing lies, uh, Suraj. So I'll, I'll give you an example how that really works uh, with, with them, right? So we have, we are jack of trades. We're saying you can use this as an intelligent onboarding. You can use it as an RPM. But here's the, the life cycle, how it starts. The patient goes to a clinic before they show up. If they are a patient who owns a data uh, phone, right? Um, they will get that information in a text message. They download the app. All they need to do, we call it quick connect. 85 um, year old will not remember passwords and emails. So we are going to put their uh, name, last name, date of birth. The moment they do that, we provision the patient wired up to the EMR automatically. Now we know this is a new patient with multi comorbidities from different APIs, claims data API, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to ask the patient certain questions to be onboarded. onboarded. This can be happening in the clinic as well. Now, with that said, we're telling them by the time the patient is onboarded, either at home or at the clinic on the device, we already create a profile. And the moment they finish that onboarding and hit the submit button, we will automatically apply. So we're acting more like uh, instead of doing a retroactive revenue cycle monitoring, we know what claims and payer information eligibility criteria from administrative side. But on top of it, we know this policies and guidelines in the clinic and what their ancillary services are provided. We wired them up. And with that questions we ask, we apply those eligibility criteria and we spit out a report saying that this patient is eligible for an RPM. We also check if claims data, if somebody built for it or if they already have been doing it. So we remove all these controls, pre-out processes already. And this is live, by the way. That way, the provider, when they see this outcome, it can be the staff member saying that this patient is eligible for an RPM. The moment they see it on the chart automatically with the eligibility criteria, they onboard the patient basically with their device. They can give our device. We give a Walmart, I mean, um, Walgreens um, blood pressure monitoring with Bluetooth. It will take them three minutes to add. And the moment they started to get the data from that, we automatically push that data there. 16 times a month, you qualify. But we take it to the next level because... RPM is $60. It's a great deal. Everybody's trying to do it, but that doesn't really uh, pay off in the long run for a treatment. If you especially have an advantage care model with Medicaid, if you are um, a federally qualified health center, you need to show outcomes and the outcomes are driven by your policy. So you tell your provider, now we onboarded this patient, but because this patient has two conditions, now we're going to actually enable other actually um, reimbursement codes because this patient applies into an extended CCM. We already checked from primary care. Nobody's billing for it. That's why you know this is eligible. When they start that process in the workflow, now that's the question you were asking. If you're working in the Epic software world, we have the ability to trigger a workflow. We do that in Colada State with Care Coordination Network. So if you're actually referred from primary care to a federal qualified health center providing addiction services, that data comes from that clinic EMR, is packaged up, pushed into their EPICS. If EPIC has a certain kind of like clinical workflow, it will trigger the certain model. Today, EMRs have some sort of clinical flows, but there's not a trigger that does it through any health information exchange. So we aggregate and call that workflow in there too. To your point, um, I think the most I will say barriers to entry for us in clinics are either they already have a solution that they integrated like Frisia for an administrative purposes, or they tried another RPM solution before. It's not really getting the bank for the buck. Their flows are hard, but our model is different. We go to a clinic instead of here's your platform, use it and pay us. We really configure the platform to their needs, to their policies within a one hour call. 
The platform can be designed in three days to so their entire new follow-up RPM monitoring process within three days. So that approach is really getting us, we replaced multiple solutions already as a startup, um, but usually if they are not open to invest in another uh, solution again, uh, sometimes they cut off without talking any other features in there. But if the discovery really uh, tells us that we can fill in the blanks for like acting like an RC, commoditized R RCM model, uh, remember we, we tell them you're gonna get three X ROI minimum. If not, we're gonna write you a check for three months, we walk away. So that's kind of like how we overcome that barriers to entry. Are we still having issues? Of course, we're having blockers, but we have the technical ability to solve and respond to that uh, to answer your question. Thank you so much. Too bad. All right, any last questions for Mehmet? I, I get one question here. Um, it might be for me, I think. Uh, should I respond to that, Steve? Um, sure. So yeah. there's a question about what are the long tail risk of product business model and how did you deliver them pertaining to regulatory compliance and investors? So uh, regular, the regulatory compliance is all, if you're talking about clinics, regulatory compliance, uh, this is a great question because we actually build the platform to spit out all the documentation, assessment scores, not only for the payer models, but also justification for clinical um, kind of expertise as well. So in other words, the, the compliance really works with the services and how you basically justify them, right? So we justify them administratively saying that this patient meets the criteria, nobody actually built for it. But from the clinic's policy, it says if the patient didn't have a uh, physical therapy, they didn't have an MRI, they automatically qualify for steroid injections, you're, you're in your ambulatory surgery center. So we gather that information, push it into the chart, we get a snapshot of the patient using clinical assessments. We also write that data into HPIs and RS of the EMR, if they are capable of. So now they're 100% compliant and we already applied this through their policies and guidelines. Now, with the business model risk, uh, with, the, with the investors and how we actually do it, I think the biggest risk for the investors is Small to mid-sized clinical implantations are easy to do it. One to three month life cycle. When you go to a health system, uh, it's going to be a chronic pain to do it literally a year and two years. I think investors are more trying to see the hard metrics from the health system. So that takes time. I mean, we're, a, I will say, relatively four-year-old company being live about two and a half years ago in production. It builds uh, some type, type of time to build those health system metrics. Hopefully, we're going to gather some of it. But other than that, I think the other big risk is really hitting their procurement processes. Uh, so if you really invest your time and efforts, we're a five people company, that's why we're raising money, expand the company a little bit more for our existing implementations. It's you need to invest time to really for six to nine months for a health system outcome to gather that and go back and sell this to the investors to say, we're, we're growing, here's the hot metric data. Uh, I think the biggest uh, uh, kind of like a, a response to it is like we we partner with the largest nonprofit scientific in the world and ACC. They're guiding us with their network as leads, but also they're guiding us with clinical protocols. Uh, we're pretty much feeling super confident along the way through our competitors. I don't know if I responded right on this one. So, well, Matt, uh, thank you so much. And I see there are other uh, questions coming in for you and for uh, some of the other companies. We unfortunately don't have time to uh, answer any more of those, but for anyone who um, has uh, questions and wants to follow up, uh, please, you can use the, the survey mechanism. You can also email us uh, or email the companies directly uh, and get your questions answered. Um, well, Matt, thank you uh, so much again for joining us for your great presentation. Uh, Scott and Shireen, thank you. Uh, again, for sharing your solutions and your stories, uh, and uh, special thanks to Janelle and to um, Dr. De Pablo and Siraj for the questions you asked and the insights that you provided uh, for this process. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I uh, hope you all have a great day.